So first of all, I just want to say thank you for everyone who is here tonight, and I want to thank all of our people who are watching this video later. And I just want to say thank you for participating in this class over the last quarter. It was kind of an amazing thing that over the course of this quarter, it seems like our views have increased online every week. And I think part of the reason for that is our world is desperate sure is. for peace. If I asked you how many of you need hope, joy, and peace in your life right now, how many of you would say, I need that right now? And a lot of people are feeling that right now. And so tonight, I want us to finish up our quarter on peace. Now, if you remember, our first class was about Jesus and how he made a great invitation to come to him and he would give you rest. That Jesus is this master that when the storms were hitting his boat, he was able to say, peace, be still. And the God who can control the storms of nature can help us in the storms of life. And so one of the things that I want to encourage us to do today is go back and focus on Jesus. And one of the reasons for this is this is one of the areas that I think there's a lot of neglect in regards to helping people discover peace. I'm going to say, as humanity, we've made a lot of progress and improvements in regards to emotional and mental health. We've talked about things like research that we have discovered about improvement of nutrition. Nutrition today is a lot better than it has in the past. We've learned about the benefits of exercise like we've never had before. We have antidepressants, we have vitamins and knowing what supplements to help you with. We have a greater number of counselors and therapists and psychiatrists than we ever have in human history. But despite all of those improvements, we've seen that anxiety, stress, and depression are still going up. And so one of the things that I would ask myself is, we're, we, I support all these things that I just mentioned a moment ago, and we're excelling in those, and I encourage us to really improve our nutrition and our exercise and get help and counseling and, and supplements and all those different things. But there's an element that I believe that's causing people to miss out on a lot. And that is the element that faith in Jesus Christ has on your life. One of the things in being a minister, one of the interesting things that I've heard from a lot of you, even since I've been here at Center Road, is I've heard a comment like this. I don't know how I would have made it this week if it wasn't for Jesus. How many of you have ever made a statement like that? I, can, I honestly don't know how people do it. And do you know what the answer is? They don't. They don't. <laughs> they don't. They do not have that hope. And so one of the greatest things that I want to encourage people us to do is if you want peace as a church, as Christians, we really need to be talking about Jesus more. We were a lot more zealous as a church universally in this. And that's what really helped us through our hardest times. I always tell people the greatest moments of hardship we've had in America when Christians stood up and taught Jesus, that's what helped get our country through. Did you know some of the greatest church plants, numerically, the greatest evangelistic campaigns we've had were after World War I, after the Great Depression, and World War II. Churches were popping up like crazy. Why? As one guy who I met once who was a veteran of World War II, he came back and said, my perspective in life completely changed and I didn't realize that all the things mom and dad were telling me about Jesus were exactly what I needed. You know, one of the greatest growths, I think, out of World War II was that's when we had one of the greatest booms we've ever had in our brotherhood in the number of preachers and churches pop up. And guess what? The, that was the right response. 
The right response when times are difficult is to preach Jesus. Now, for us in our time right now, if I ask what is the greatest challenge that we're focusing on in the world today, we'd be talking about moral decline, we'd be talking about COVID, we'd be talking about media, we'd be talking about all those kind of things. And so, if we follow past precedent and example, what should we be doing? Talking about Jesus. And the reason for this is I do believe we need to improve all those things that I just mentioned to help our mental and emotional health. But you can't ever have true peace in your life without Jesus. And let me ask you this. If you could, if you could have peace without Jesus and it was found in wealth and it was found in fame, then how come the richest and the most famous people in our country seem to lack the greatest amount of peace? You see, you can't have peace without Jesus. And let's say hypothetically, for instance, let's say you lived as good of a life as you could. You married your high school sweetheart, you had a good job, you made a lot of money, but then you die. In the realm of truth, in the realm of reality, in the realm of eternity, you can have all the things the world says you should have, but if you do not have Jesus, where are you in eternity? So even then, you cannot have real peace without Jesus. Even if you could have a hundred years on earth to have peace as the world would say you should have peace, that a hundred years in view of eternity is like a drop in the bucket. The only way that I believe we are really going to shape culture, the only way I believe we're going to help people discover peace, the only way I think we're going to help the younger generations is if we start standing up and speaking the name of Jesus with compassion but with boldness. More than we ever have before. If you've seen in the last couple of days on our Facebook and our email, I did a post about faithfulness and loyalty and I quoted from Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 saying be faithful unto even to the point of death and I and I and today's one I talked about how Jesus made the mention that he has the words of, where Peter says to whom shall we go you have the words of eternal life we're actually gonna go over that tonight and the reason why I want people to read those passages is because the only way you're going to discover peace and joy and hope and true love is when you experience the faithfulness of Christ and you reciprocate that back. When you hear the words of Christ and you realize how powerful and meaningful they are and you allow the word of Christ to transform you. Now I know I'm talking with you. I know I was just talking with some of our people uh, right before church and they were lamenting the state of our culture and I'm gonna tell you sometimes I feel like Jeremiah sometimes I feel like Isaiah and I lament at the state of our culture where it's going but evil has always existed and evil cultures have always existed and evil governments have always existed but what is the one person that was able to still influence despite all those things Jesus Christ. I think the solution isn't just the democratic process. I don't think it's just this or that, though that may be part of it in, in some ways. God may use it in that way. But ultimately, I think it's Christians being Christian and speaking about Jesus Christ. Because I, I don't trust worldly people who don't follow Jesus to change the world for Christ like Christians do. I mean, think about that. In the first century world, they said Paul and this sect that he's a part of, they turned this world upside down. You're telling me a group of fishermen and tax collectors and zealots and ragtame, uneducated people cha changed the world? Yeah, because they were moved by the Spirit, spoke the word of God, and led people to Christ. 
You know, I really truly believe what Paul says, that the gospel still has power to save. Gary. Right. But at the same time, if we, those are the things that the world is telling us, the world, I say, I mean Satan is what it really is. Those are the things that are going to make you happy. If we, if we view it in eternity, like you said, we're going to live in eternity, and it's either depends upon where we're going to be, but if the world tells us God doesn't exist, then those things make sense, you know? I mean, in a selfish sense. And those are all really good points. And actually, we're, I'm going to be emphasizing some of those points in just a moment. Because isn't the world... We grew up in a culture... American has typically, since its creation, has had a somewhat of a Christian worldview. There was a belief in a God and belief in the Bible and things like that. That's becoming more and more non-existent. Um, but I think the, reason, the way to combat that is to teach the Word of God and to help people know who the God of the Bible is and to teach it and to be live it out so much so that people will look and they're questioning it and saying, is that true? Because let me tell you, every, all of our young people are going to do what the writer of Ecclesiastes did. They're going to try a whole bunch of philosophies of life and try to figure out which one's true, which one's right. But as Christians, we have that. And here's the thing. This worldview that we're seeing, this decline that we're seeing more and more in our society, can't you just feel and notice people seem to be angrier and meaner and more depressed than ever before? Then, even in my lifetime, I'm thinking, okay, I, is it just the, you know, the recency argument? I only see this because it's more recent. Or is it actually people are this way? And I think, <laughs> you know, people are getting meaner and angrier. But, but I want us to think, why is this? You know, one of the things that we have seen is a decline in church membership. Um, which, you know, you, you can... I'm, I'm just going to go into a little bit of sim simple. I'm going to read an, read part of an article, actually, that I actually sent our elders um, earlier this week. And it was a really heartbreaking uh, article. But uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, context prior. We've known since the 1980s that the church has plateaued and has declined. Since the 1980s. And since then, the church has done a lot of things to try to make up for it. And in that period, and I've read probably close to probably 500 church growth books, uh, what we've probably seen is 
there was a shift in the 1980s to really go towards more of a business model church, which I think was one of the reasons why the church is in the state that it's in today. And that's not a good thing. And, and I say this because, as you know, my education and my background is in the business world. And so a lot of these books that I would read, I'm just thinking, this looks like my marketing book or my operation supply book in college in the business world, but with a occasional throw in church and Jesus in the book. And, and, and as a result of that, we've become more consumer based as a church, we've become more entertainment based as a church, more program oriented as a church, rather than just going back to the simplicity of the scriptures. And have you noticed every great movement that Christians have ever made, whether it be the American Restoration Movement, whether it be the Reformation Movement, the Great Awakening, all of them, every single time it was, let's get back to the simplicity of the Bible and just do what the Bible says. And one of the things that we have seen is, over since the 1980s, we've seen a lot of different things happen. Programs and entertainment now dominate. Shallow preaching sounds more like self-help motivational speeches rather than preaching from the Word of God. And as a result, we have seen how, how a lot of ways church is being done. Like if, if Jesus were a minister today and it had a modicum of success, this is what he would probably do. He'd probably write a book and hope it would make it on the New York Times bestseller list. Probably show up on a lot of different TV shows. He would probably find the most talented musicians to put behind him. He would probably wear some nice clothes because now if you want to be a modern day minister, you got to dress really nicely. I don't do that, obviously, compared to most. But, and, and, and you see all this, but here's the thing that when I hear, see people advocating, now you say, hold on. If you actually read how Jesus did ministry, he didn't do any of that. He didn't, and in fact, the things that we would say you should do, Jesus actually did the very opposite. He was very humble. He was very direct. He was very bold. He was very compassionate. And we're going to see some of that. And we're going to say, how do we help people achieve this kind of peace? Now, here's the thing about peace, and we're going to talk a little bit about church membership here in a moment. I believe that there is a correlation for the decline of immorality with the, the decline in the belief in Jesus Christ, the belief in the authority of the Bible, and so forth. Why? Because I do a lot of reading, and I do a lot of research, and I read things by secular people and religious people, and I try to get, up and get it all down to here. And one of the things I discovered is people are claiming they need a higher level of peace than ever before. How do we know? Well, just in this last year, depression is up, suicide attempts are up, drug use is up, domestic abuse is up. People need peace. And the only way I get people to truly change is I could make a law, but do people necessarily follow laws? What we need to do is change hearts. And the only one that I know without a shadow of doubt has the power to change hearts is Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. God the Father. I could tell you all, I could preach all night and you could walk away unchanged. I could do a whole bunch of nice things for you and you could be unchanged. I could make a policy saying, okay, Center Road, we're all going to do this. And you might all do it, but it may not make a difference. What will make a difference is when people allow God to change their lives hearts. That's what God said about David. Exactly. And so one of the things that I want us to do is if we can help people get into understanding and knowing Jesus Christ, then we have Jesus shape and change their hearts. You know, the difference between Christianity and Buddhists is Buddhists claim to have peace, but it, theirs is a very work-based system. If I deny myself pleasure, if I go and meditate, if I do this and this and this, then I will have serenity and peace. That's never worked. How many of you have tried and tried and tried on your own to have peace all on your own and it's never worked? And guess what? You have the motivation to do it because you're trying to help yourself. 
But Jesus Christ, he offers peace as a gift. Now, here's the thing, though, about a gift. One, you have to be willing to accept it. But two, you have to accept it on his terms. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, church. As Christians and as a church universally, people don't like to accept God's gifts on his terms. For example, grace. Are we saved by grace? Yes. Can we earn grace? No. But do we have to accept it on his terms? Yes. What, so uh, I say I accept grace, but I'm going to deny Jesus and live how I want to live. No, it doesn't work like that. Even Jesus says, you, many are going to say, Lord, Lord, and not be saved on that day. Not enter the kingdom. So how can we do this? How can we change? I think we really have to make a push. And I think we need to do a better job teaching in our homes. I think we need to educate our kids. We need to educate our grandchildren. And I often tell people this. It's a numbers game. We're, we're losing the number and culture game for this. We, okay, I'm going to give you a simple math equation. Marketing, okay? Some mar it's a, it's a little bit of a marketing lesson. In marketing, they try to bombard you with ads. How many ads do you think you get hit per day? Okay? It's in the tens of thousands a day. Okay? Let's say, how often do you come to worship service per week? Okay, let's say you're let's say you're a good Christian. Okay, let's say you come to Wednesday night Sunday morning Bible class, Sunday morning worship, and let's say you go to a life group. Okay, four hours. Okay, people watch that amount of Netflix in one night. So what's just going to have a greater set of influence? And think about our kids now. They're always connected to the internet. Then they go. To school with an anti-God perspective and it is in our education system and then they're around friends who don't know Jesus we have to get more involved and you're, you're and why because all the numbers are gonna are showing it I honestly believe as our belief and faith in Jesus Christ and the authority of the Bible has gone down I believe morality has correlated with that and I believe the that um, the facts Prove that. I want to read part of an article done by Gallup. Now, you guys are all probably familiar with Gallup. You've heard of a Gallup poll. Um, they're one of the most reliable organizations in regards to knowing how to do a poll, how to do surveys, and so forth. Just this last week, they came out with some information about church membership. And you want to know why is our culture going down and why is our culture going down so quickly? I think it has to do with our involvement in prioritizing Jesus Christ in the church and living out true faith. So Gallup wrote this. I'm, I pulled out some um, excerpts from the article. It says, American membership in houses of worship continued to decline last year, dropping below 50% for the first time in Gallup's eight-decade trend. In 2020, 40% of Americans said, now this, we know that this doesn't mean faithful Christians. It's just them saying, I'm a Christian, okay? So we're taking them at face value, okay? So if the face value, you then authentic Christianity. But if the face value is kind of low, then authentic one's gonna be a little bit lower, so, which makes it even more um, heartbreaking. In 2020, 40% of Americans said they belong to a church, synagogue, or mosque down from 50% in 2018 and 70% in 1999. So we went from 70% of people saying that they belonged to some kind of faith group and had membership, and in a 20 year span, now down to 47%. Now, hear, hear this. Um, the US church membership was 73% when Gallup first measured it in 1937 and remained near 70% for the next six decades before beginning a steady decline around the 21st century. So from 1930s to about 2000, in that whole span, Americans in general had about a 70% proclamation rate of saying, I belong to some kind of faith, to some kind of church or mosque or synagogue. 70% from the 1930s. So there was almost no change in 60 years. 
2000. And now why is 2000 kind of important? Because in 1980, we started seeing a change in how we did church. And you typically, when you read college, um, how they do research projects, they usually do it over 20 year spans because you don't really know the impact of an event until 20 years after. So that's why 2000 is kind of an eye awakening when the church plateaued in 1980 and started doing church differently. What are we now seeing in the year 2000? And in the year 2000, that's when we see, saw not just a steady decline, but a sharp decline. Okay, let's continue on with this excerpt. It says, the decline in church membership is primarily a function of the increasing number of Americans who express no religious preference. Over the past two decades, the percentage of Americans who do not identify with any religion has grown from 8% in 1990, uh, 1998 to 2000 to 13% in 2008 to 2010, and then 21% over the past three years. In the past three years. Church membership is strongly correlated with age, as 66% of traditionalists U.S. adults born before 1946 belong to a church, compared with 58% of baby boomers, 50% of those in Generation X, and 36% among millennials. The limited data Gallup has on church membership among the portion of Generation Z that has reached adulthood are so far showing the same church membership rates as those of millennials. So right around low 30s mid to low 30s for Gen Z. The decline in church membership then appears largely tied to population change, with those in the older generation who are likely to be church members replaced in the U.S. adult population with people in younger generations who are less likely to belong. The change has become increasingly apparent in recent decades because millennials and Gen Z are further apart from traditionalists in their church membership rates, about 30 points lower then Baby Boomer and Generation X are 8 and 16 points, respectively. Also, each year the younger generations are making up an increasingly larger part of the entire U.S. adult population. Still, population replacement doesn't fully explain the decline in church membership, as adults and older generations have shown roughly double-digit decreases from two decades ago. Church membership is down even more, 15 points, in the past decade among millennials. The two major trends driving the drop in church membership, more adults with no religious preference, kind of like what you were talking about, Gary. They don't believe in God. There's no respect for God, despite what Romans says about nature. Uh, and falling rates of church membership among people who do not have a religion are apparent in each of the generations over time. Since the turn of the century, there have been near doubling in the percentage of traditionalists from 4% to 7%. So the most faithful group in church membership, we're now seeing an increase in them having no religious affiliation too. Baby boomers from 7% to 13%, Gen X to 11 to 20% with no religious affiliation. Currently, 31% of millennials have no religious affiliation, which is up from 22% a decade ago. This is a fast increase. Similarly, 33% of the portion of Gen Z that has reached adulthood have no religious preference. You know, as I mentioned probably months ago, I, I cited a book that was done by the Barna Group that says Gen Z is going to be double the rate of atheism in our culture and is going to be the most atheistic culture America has ever seen. And these numbers that Gallup is now saying is actually proving what the Barna Group had already said. Also, each generation has seen a decline in church membership among those who do affiliate with a specific religion. These declines have ranged between six and eight points over the past two decades from, for traditionalists, baby boomers, and Gen X who identify with the religious faith. In just the past 10 years, the share of religious millennials who are church members has declined from 63% to 50%. As would be expected, given the 20-point decline in church membership overall, the Gallup data shows declines among all major subgroups of the U.S. population beyond age, with some differences in the size of that decline. Now, why this is important? Part of this is important. It's saying that every subgroup that they have been analyzed, every group has gone down. Meaning, it's not just 
one group and blame, okay, it's just the elderly people or just the young people. They're saying it's universally happening to every subgroup. Among religious groups, the decline in membership is steeper among Catholics, down 18 points from 76% to 58%, than Protestants, down 9 points from 73% to 64%. This mirrors the historical change in church attendance Gallup has documented among Catholics, with sharp declines among Catholics, but not among Protestants. Gallup does not have sufficient data to analyze the trends of other religious faiths. In addition to Protestants, declines in church memberships are proportionally smaller among political conservatives, Republicans, married adults, and college graduates. These groups tend to have um, among the highest rates of church membership, along with the Southern residents and non-Hispanic black adults. Over the past two decades, declines in church membership have been even greater among Eastern residents and Democrats. Still, political independents have lower rates of, of church membership than Democrats do. Now, even though that was a mention by them. I wasn't making a political statement. I was just reading what the article said from Gallup. Now, Gallup is not a religious organization. They're just citing the facts. So we're seeing that every subgroup is going down. It's a universal problem. Now, this is a problem that I believe has been cited. In 1925, there, William Jennings Bryan, he was a three-time former Democratic presidential candidate, and he was a former Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson. He made this comment as, after a trial known as the Scopes Trial, does anyone know what the Scopes Trial is? Yeah. It was the, the teaching of evolution in schools and really pushing God out of the public square. Okay. Now, William Jennings Bryan actually was actually was fighting for that not to be the case. He didn't want the teaching of evolution, he wanted the teaching of Jesus Christ. Um, but this is what he says. If, if civilization is to be saved from the wreckage threatened by intelligence, not consecrated by love, it must be saved by the moral code of the meek and lowly Nazarene. His teachings and his teachings alone can solve the problems that vex the heart and perplex the world. I believe that was a very true statement. And now, almost 100 years after that statement, we have now seen that that is true. And you know it in your own life. The, the truest problems in your life can only be solved with Jesus Christ. And the problems of this world can only be solved with Jesus Christ. We've tried everything else, and it hasn't worked. So how do we do this? As I see a growing problem of people growing with peace, there are three things that I really want. I'll, I'll, let me back up a little bit. You know, as people are lacking in peace, it is ultimately because people don't want Jesus. I don't like to make a bold statement like that, but that really is the truth. You, it, I don't like citing bumper stickers, but it really says, no Jesus, no peace. No, no peace, no Jesus. I mean, that's a kind of corny bumper circle, but it's true. You can't have peace without Jesus Christ. But even in the church world, sometimes people don't actually want the real Jesus and the Jesus of the Bible. And people say, how do you know that? Well, sometimes people want their own version or opinion of Jesus. I remember growing up, I grew up in a Christian home, grew up in a church setting where people would say, well, I think Jesus would say or do this. And then I would read my Bible and say, actually, Jesus said and did the opposite of what you're saying. So do we actually want the real Jesus? Because here's the thing about the real Jesus. He's not exactly how we always want him to be. And here's the thing that I tell, I've told our church, I've told our life group, our young adults, that Jesus is the true source of joy, hope, and peace. But in order to have those, you need three things especially. And I want to list three, these three things and read a passage of scripture. One, you have to know the real Jesus. The Jesus of the Bible and not just your opinions, feelings, and experiences. Because that can shape your perspective of who Jesus really is. So Micah, how do we get a true version of who Jesus really is? You read the Bible and you let Jesus say who he is and what he has done out of his own mouth. You know, I could ask... I could ask Peggy, Peggy, tell me what you know about Mike. And you can tell me some things, and 
A lot of them would be true. Or I could just go to Mike and say, hey, Mike, tell me about yourself. Which would be more valid? Mike. Mike. You see, because I'm getting it firsthand. And that, sometimes we do that with Jesus. We'd rather hear hearsay information off of Facebook rather than just opening up the Bible. And when you do that, you're going to get a faulty view of Jesus. How many of you have ever read something online that was false about Jesus? But people were like, yeah, I believe that. And I'm like, no, that's stupid. Or people teach false doctrines like health and wealth. I see health and wealth teachings all the time on Facebook. And I'm like, no, then Jesus was horrible because he lost his health on the cross and he was poor. And they, the very clothes he had were taken. So if we're going to hold that then he wasn't very good. Neither was Paul. But we have to know the real Jesus. Now, sometimes seeing the real Jesus can be difficult because he's not always a long-haired guy with a perfect beard, wearing a sash, and holding a little lamb. Sometimes he's a savior that tells you to repent of your sins. Sometimes he's the savior that calls you to levels of commitment that you're not comfortable with. Sometimes he's the savior that tells you to die to yourself and live for him. Sometimes he's the Savior who spoke more about hell than anyone else in the New Testament. Sometimes he's the Savior who was bloody and beaten on a cross and hard to look at because our sin put him there. Sometimes he's the Savior that tells you to put him even before your own family. Sometimes he's a Savior that will cause you to be hated because his morality will not match up with culture's morality. If you want true peace in your life, you're going to have to know the real Jesus. Because you can't truly love someone if you don't truly know them. Isn't that something that you wish? I want, I know that people love me. The, the ones I know who truly love me are the ones who really know me. Isn't that a true axiom? The ones who really know me are the ones who truly love me. The ones who really know who I am and sought to know who I am and truly accepted me in that way. Those are the ones who like me, who love me. I just think Jesus is asking us to do the same thing. Jesus is a God of grace, and he's a God of wrath. He was a God of compassion, but he also offended everybody. <laughs> so we have to understand who is the real Jesus, and what did he actually teach? What did he actually do? I challenged, and I've challenged our young adults, especially I said, if you want to know the real Jesus, just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Don't listen to your parents to a degree. I'm not saying don't listen to your parents. I mean, <laughs> but I'm saying if you want an objective viewpoint, don't listen to Micah. Don't listen to your friends. Don't read Facebook. Just, just do this one exercise. Just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Don't, don't read a commentary. Don't read anything else. Don't have anything influence. Just let Jesus speak for himself. When you do that exercise, you will come to know and love Jesus like you've never had before. And then you'll be like, wow, I, did not, I cannot believe Jesus said that. There have been times when I quoted Jesus, and I would, I would ask some of our young people, I'd be like, hey, what do you think about this statement? And they were like, oh, that seems really harsh. That's mean. I can't believe anyone. Who, what kind of Christian would say that? Jesus. And they were like, oh. Here's the thing. If you want to fall in love with Jesus in a way that transforms your life, you've got to know the real Jesus. Isn't, doesn't Jesus know you? He knows the heart of every person. He knows all your flaws, and he still loves you. Do you know all of Jesus' perfections and love him? You know, that's something we need to do. So one, know the real Jesus. Number two, you have to be all in. I think this is one of the things what we have seen. You know, Walt has taught the book of Revelation. And those letters to the churches of Asia weren't writ written to heathens. They were written to Christians. And were they always very, very happy? No. no. I think if Jesus was writing a letter to the American church right now, it would sound very much like the letters written to the first century churches that he wrote to in the book of Revelation. You know, Jesus made known that you have to be all in. He made known, he said, you're either with me or against me. That's a, that's a, that's a pretty bold statement. Think about this. If you're, if you're 
driving your car, you're either on the left side or the right side. If you're in the middle, you're going to get smashed. What have we done with the American church in our faith? We've driven down the middle of the road and we're getting smashed. And then we're looking and wondering why our kids are leaving the church, why culture is declining, and why Christians aren't being as influential. 60 years, 70% of people said, I profess some allegiance to a church or Jesus or the Bible. Now it's not even close to that. And we're wondering why. Because we haven't jumped in. I tell people, you have to jump in with both feet. Have you ever... If you ever played sports or played an instrument, how many of the teachers or coaches or instructors say, if you're going to do this, you've got to do it with all of your might. You've got to do it hard. How many of them say, hey, go casually jog around the field once and we'll call it good? Do those teams win? So should it be shocking that, be, that we've encouraged an entertainment-based, program-based, shallow preaching based Christianity, consumer-based, comfortable Christianity, and then think, oh, we're going to win the war, the spiritual war? We're, we're, we're actually going to think that's going to be the case? No. The church in Ephesus was doing all the things right, and Jesus was saying, but you forgot your first love. Do all the things that you're doing, but love me first. The thing is, we, we are not even on par as an American church of the things that Ephesus was doing. Now, he would tell us, do what Ephesus is doing and love me first. You know, I read how he writes to the church in the first century calling them lukewarm. Do you remember what Jesus said? This was from Jesus' own mouth. He says, you're like lukewarm. What is he going to do with you if you're lukewarm? He's going to spit you out. Look at the stats I just gave you from a secular organization known for being one of the most reliable in polls. We're seeing the American church being spit out right now. Now, one of the things Jesus did does oftentimes is he says, you guys should be aware of the condition of your generation and you should repent. You need to change. You need to do something. And I think that's what... I, I honestly believe this is an opportunity. And I think we have to ask ourselves, have we allowed shallowness? I mean, look at how shallow our churches are, have become. Oh, they didn't give me what I want, so I'll go to this church and they'll give me what I want. That's not church. Or they, this preacher will actually read the Bible. Do you know what's really odd to me? Even like Christine, who just moved here, said, hey, I like how this church preaches the Bible. And I'm just thinking, why, are, uh, why should there not be churches not preaching the Bible? That, that is foreign to me. But there are a lot that don't. I've even heard some of the biggest name religious figures in our country say, I refuse to teach on sin, repentance, and hell. And I'm like, do I enjoy teaching those things? No. But how did God prepare the people for Jesus? He sent John to teach repentance. Who talked more about hell than anyone in the New Testament? Jesus Christ. What does Paul tell us? Be careful for the judgment to come. I don't like teaching those things, but you have to if you love people. Now, do we now have people done it in a very fear-based way that they shouldn't have? Yes, and I don't think they should have. It needs to come from a place of love, motivation, not fear motivation. But we do need to get back all in. You know, even in the church setting, they, they say, if the ministers, if 20% if of your church membership is serving in the church, you're doing okay. And I'm just thinking, when I read Romans 12, I think 100% of membership should be serving in the church. Is that radical? What if I told you today, okay, you get to leave with your health from the church building, but only 20% 20 20 of your body is going to function. Do you think you're going to live? No. Church, if we love our kids and our grandkids, we have to be all in. That's the biggest indictment our young people are saying is, they say, if mom and dad and grandma and grandpa actually believe in this, why aren't they being all in on it? Now, we see that they're buying into some lies, but are they jumping all in on these lies? Yes, they are. 
Because they do have the right mentality. If you believe something, you should be two feet in. They're doing it. They're just not doing it in the right things. What are we, how are we going to change that? We show them we're jumping in with two feet too. But in the right things. Jesus Christ, the word of God, the church, biblical morality. As long as we have this shallow Christianity, we're never going to influence. How many people have prioritized sports and music over Jesus? And they're wondering why their kids don't go to church after high school. Or, they, or they'll say, you know what, I'm permissive on watching this on Netflix. So on church on Sunday, you're saying, holy, 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 and then... On Monday night, you're watching something on Netflix that you would never watch in front of Jesus. Your kids see that and they think, hypocrite. Let me tell you, the thing that inspires you is when you see a legitimate, how many of you have seen a legitimate, authentic Christian and they live it out and you're like, wow, that's convicting. That's convicting. Let me tell you, our young people see professors who are convicted in their immorality, who are willing to go to jail, who are willing to lose their job, who are willing to go on national television and spew their hateful, sinful, immorality philosophies. But the young kids going to their classroom are inspired by that boldness. And they're jumping in with that professor. The only way we're going to do it is they, if they see the same level of passion from their parents and grandparents and church members. The shallow Christianity has failed us. 1980, 20 years later, span, 2000, boom, sharp decline. I've been saying this for years. Gallup is now exactly proving it. it, it we have to change. Walt, you have a comment? Yes. We see the world ready to die for the things you're convicted of. Yes, we do. Are we ready to die for what we're convicted of? And that's something we really have to start asking ourselves. And then the third thing that I want to do, and then read the passage, and I have to go through this, is you have to obey his authority. You have to obey. Let me tell you, people don't believe in... If you, if you tell people there's no God, then you're, what you're saying is there's no authority. You can live however you want to live. That's why they want you to get rid of God. Because if there is a moral God up there then do I have to submit to him? Yes. If I get God out of the picture, I don't have to submit to anyone. You know, the, one of the big characteristics in American culture, one of the biggest values we value is our, our belief that we're independent. No one has to tell me what to do. Why do you think young people are so disrespectful nowadays? Because we grew that mentality. You don't have to listen to anyone. You don't have to depend on anyone. When I became a Christian, I realized I, how dependent I was on Jesus Christ. I'm a very independent person by nature. But the more I get older, the more I realize independence doesn't save me. Dependence and humility on Jesus Christ saves me. And I have to, we have to teach our kids that. That's why they don't find credibility in the Bible. They don't find it authoritative because we haven't taught them to. We haven't taught our young people that there is a God and he has to be obeyed. Here's the thing. Jesus is very firm on this. We think he's just this cute little Jesus. No, Jesus says in Luke 6, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Right. He calls him out. That is, and he's very direct. Luke 13, he says, repent or perish. And if, you don't want, if, you, and if you're not sure what I'm trying to say, look down another verse where I say, one verse down after, where I say, repent or perish. You see, Jesus is authoritative. And as long as we don't believe in the authority of God in the Bible, it won't shape anything. Have you ever read the Old Testament? Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so forth. One of the key words that the prophets consistently said was, Thus saith the Lord. That was the first thing they would say before the proclamation. If you would just give me a couple more minutes, I want to read a passage of scripture. I want you to think of these three things that I just mentioned. Knowing the real Jesus... Being all in and obeying the authority of Jesus Christ and his word. Because this is where we're going to see. In John chapter 6, John, in John chapter 6, we see Jesus at the point of his popularity. He fed the 5,000. You know, he gave free food. And not just feeding of the 5,000 
the way that they counted women as slaves, it was probably closer to Jesus feeding the 15,000. And out of all the miracles, there's only two miracles mentioned in all four Gospels. The resurrection and the feeding of the 5,000. So Jesus is at the peak of his popularity. But what would, he, what would we do in the American church? The, an American minister or pastor, they would say, Okay, follow me on Instagram and buy my best-selling book and come to my event and I'm going to charge you. And, and they would try to soak up the popularity. Jesus actually does something that's completely the opposite of any church growth book he, I've ever read. He says, okay, I'm going to teach something really, really hard, and I'm going to try to cause people not to follow me. I'm going to try to cause people not to follow me. Why? Because the ones who say, no, I'm still going to follow you, those are the true followers of Jesus. In John chapter 6, starting in verse 53, going through 69, um, Jesus teaches this hard teaching, but you can read that whole chapter. But this is right shortly after the feeding of the 5,000. But in verse 53, it says, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eat so Jesus is making known who he is, you know, know the real Jesus. And what he's really teaching. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Oh, now look at the response of the disciples and then look at how Jesus calls them out. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, this to them. Does this offend you? How many preachers do you hear that say, teaching? They teach a really hard message and say, if you really want to follow me, if you want eternal life, and then people are grumbling at me like, oh, they're not, he's not saying very something. Jesus says, am I offending you? Because he was. He, the goal isn't to offend. The goal is to convict. But the truth will sometimes offend. But look at what he is saying here. He asks them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many... Now look at the response of this people. Peak of his popularity. He fed the 5,000, more likely probably 15,000. One of the biggest miracles in Jesus' ministry. Biggest crowd. They wanted to make him king after this. He teaches this hard lesson. Now this is his response. After teaching them a hard truth and offending them. It says right here in verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. That doesn't sound like a very good church growth book, does it? I'm at the peak of my popularity. Now I'm going to filter out who's actually going to want to follow me. You have to eat my flesh, drink my blood. Now obviously he wasn't preaching about cannibalism. He was teaching really about commitment and understanding his deity and truly following him. And they were having a hard time accepting it. They just wanted to be there for the free food. They wanted Jesus to be king so they could be free from the Romans. But Jesus is making none. The Holy Spirit who brings life, the one who's giving Jesus the words, the words he was speaking came from the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus saying all these things, and they're grumbling, and he's saying, are you offended? To the point where people left. But who truly remained faithful? What did, why do you think Peter was willing to eventually... Now, Peter wasn't perfect. He did deny, and Jesus did reinstate him. He did make a mistake among the Gentile believers. 
But was he ultimately faithful? Yes. To the point where he was willing to be crucified upside down. Crucified just like his Savior. He was all in. Do you think Peter influenced the first century church? We're talking about him today. He, he was one of the most influential figures in human history. Why? Because while everyone else was leaving because they were being offended by the truth, he knew the truth. And the truth was, you are the, the Holy One of God. You have the words of eternal life. Peter knew the real Jesus. He accepted and obeyed his authority. And he was all in. Church, if we really are wanting to save our community, save our country, save our world, save our families, our kids and our grandkids, we got to know the real Jesus. we got to be all in. Let me tell you, the opposition is all in. Satan is all in. Don't you know that? Satan is all in on his side. And we got to obey the authority of Christ, and we got to teach our kids to obey the authority. Why do you think kids nowadays are willing to not listen to anyone and destroy anything? They don't respect authority. Because we stop saying, thus saith the Lord, because it might offend somebody. Guess what? Jesus offended people almost daily. He didn't do it. He wasn't preaching to offend people, but his preaching did offend people. But... It also saved people. Peter is saved. The apostles, minus Judas, are saved. You're saved. Why? Because you accepted the words of Jesus Christ, and you didn't leave. You want to know if, you're a true, if someone's a true follower? When Jesus himself tries to push you away, and you won't leave. That is a true follower of Jesus. That's how we're going to change the world. That's the kind of follower I want to be. That's the kind of follower I want our church to be. And I think that's the kind of church our church in America needs to be if we at, at all want to influence our kids and grandkids to be saved. So I hope today you'll come to know the real Jesus. Get your theology from the Bible, not Facebook. Accept authority and be all in like you never have before. And let me tell you, that might wake up your kids and grandkids and be like, whoa, mom is psycho for Jesus now. Well, if I have to be a psycho for Jesus to save my kids, so be it. I will be a psycho for Jesus if it means they go to heaven. I don't care about being liked by this world. I want my kids and grandkids and your kids and grandkids to go to heaven. This is how we're going to do it. This is what Jesus said. So I want to thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for giving me a few extra minutes. And I thank you for being here this quarter about peace. Because the true peace that we can only have is if we have Jesus. Thank you. I could, you know, unless we love Jesus, unless we know Jesus, we can't love him. And if we love him, we will feed his sheep. Exactly. Thank you all.